I'm Jonathan McFadden, and I'm an assistant professor of printmaking at the University of Kentucky. So I've been here for in Lexington for about two years now, and I kind of got the position, and it was kind of like my dream job because we're in the process right now of, in May, getting handed keys to a new facility, so which is awesome, and in academia, it doesn't really ever happen in the course of your career. So when I accepted the job, uh, the director of the School of Art sended, sent me uh, the blueprints for the printmaking studio. He's like, what do you want this to look like? So I've been able to kind of reinvigorate uh, printmaking here and transform that facility and kind of design it how I want to have a print shop look, uh, which is oddly kind of pulling a lot from my experiences working at Tandem and then being an artist re in residence at High Point in Minneapolis. Um, so to give you some more background information, I'm originally from Houston. I did my undergrad and got a BFA in printmaking at Texas State University, so studying under Brian Johnson and Jeffrey Dell. So if you all aren't familiar with their work, I would check them out. They make some awesome prints. Uh, while I was there, I also decided, you know, one degree wasn't enough, double majored, and got a BA in French. So after I graduated, there's a program that, that U.S. and French embassies have where you can, if you've studied French in college, you can go over there and work in their school system for a year. And... That's relevant because a lot of the times when I say I went to grad school in Scotland, people are like, how did you end up there? So um, the great thing about the French is they have a ton of vacation time. So I get there and I work for literally maybe three weeks before we had a week off um, and use that time to, I was like, well, while I'm here, I might as well check out uh, the grad schools in the UK because I was living in Lille in northeastern France, and it was just take the channel train, and I'm in London. So I kind of toured around those schools and uh, ended up really liking uh, Edinburgh College of Art. And, you know, it just worked out that they had the best offer for me and ended up going to school there, which really kind of established my studio practice as it stands today, um, because even though like my degrees in printmaking, we all kind of worked as a larger MFA community between all of the disciplines, and we were also required to do an installation each year that we were there. So with this kind of, they called it a project space, it kind of threw you for a loop and made you change your practice because it was like, all right, I'm making all these prints, and now I have to make an installation and kind of think about things differently. So that's kind of stuck with me. Um, and then after I graduated there, uh, it was 2009, so the recession was like full steam ahead and ended up working for a little bit at Tandem, um, doing some of Nico Lopez and Judy Pfaff's prints and hoping out there before landing my first teaching position back in Houston and then moving to Minnesota State University where I taught printmaking for a while and then had a residency at High Point for a year. So since grad school, um, the work's really been kind of centered on, you know, mass media and social media and kind of ebbs and flows, whether it's talking about something more specific or kind of a larger, like, zeitgeist of what's going on with these news cycles. So, um, uh, installation like semi-submersible Helios is kind of where, in my work, I started deconstructing the images that I was using. So that installation it has all these kind of uh, flower burst type things, and that's the BP Helios logo. And then I'm using that to reconstruct images of that 
oil derrick exploding. So that transformed into like print work as well, where I'm kind of collaging that imagery back in um, to that to make the 2D work that kind of exists with the installation as well. And then that kind of led into uh, work I was doing at High Point uh, with installation, uh, adversarial relationships are a hard habit to break. And that kind of allowed me to you know, look at the larger picture because I had, a, I think it was a 10 month residency there and then an exhibition at the end of it. So, you know, I wasn't really constrained by a time frame. And, you know, once you're out of grad school, it's not like critique, 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 and like, oh crap, I have to finish this work to have it ready. You can think of things in a longer time frame and, you know, allow the work to evolve. You know, and I have this practice of, you know, I'll fill the drying rack, at least one, if not two, top to bottom with paper and just start printing. And those images tend to become stencils that are used throughout the entire body of work. At least with the, the screen printed work, it's shifting now that I'm using more photographer uh, in my work. But that's kind of like how my practice is. You know, where it's just fill it up, let's start printing. And if the work takes, you know, eight, nine months to finish, so be it. But then at the end of it, it's, you know, I tend to not have finished work. And then all of a sudden there's, you know, 50 new pieces. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that will feed both into the print the 2D print work and then the installations as well. So I'm kind of working on them both. And I have a kind of loose idea of what the installation is going to look like. And there was a comment my theory professor at Edinburgh made um, who did a lot of writing and research on installation. And he would always refer to installation as drawing within a three-dimensional space. So I kind of take that approach where there's a loose idea, you know, a gallery director has sent me photographs of the space and I'm kind of drawing on it and putting, you know, collaged imagery of what I want of it in the studio into the image of the gallery to kind of get a sense of it. But there's not an exact idea unless I'm not traveling to that space, which tends to be rare. I think like one installation I've not traveled to and had it installed, um, which I'm not a big fan of because I'm like, oh, I would have done this differently if I had been there. Um, so that work's kind of gone that way. And then, you know, it's gone from, like I said, the larger zeitgeist to a more kind of concentrated uh, use of the imagery in these kind of media events where, you know, if you're looking at like a uh, Valley of the Clueless, it's taking, um, a set. Yeah. It's in the print work. Yeah. Uh, so it's a photographer and it's the main image of all the monitors is from, uh, the Friedrichstrasse train station in Berlin where, the DDR, you know, agents are using it as a surveillance device of, you know, all the people going between East and West Berlin. And I was there last summer doing a residency with 55 Limited. And there I was out and we were at the Palace of Tears, which is the museum, like commemorating, you know, this spot between the East and the West. And I remember Peter Mayer, the owner of 55, uh, making comment like, I had no idea they were watching us that much. And it's kind of sparked this turn where now the work is taking on more of this uh, surveillance aesthetic. So a lot of the imagery in the pictures is like all of the different media events going on at that time, which then translated into a uh, installation piece um, 
called The Trend is Towards Naturalness that I did at uh, Georgetown College this past fall. And that's in my Tumblr feed. I haven't updated my site yet to include that. Uh, and that has a stop motion animation of that same print that is switching between these different media events, but also using the targeted web advertising that pops up in my um, web browser and on my Facebook feed, you know, that goes through different things that I'm like looking at, you know, and purchasing and like the random odd thing ads that pop up that will be like, buy better underwear, uh, which is like, what the hell? Um, and thinking about that, like this culture that's arising and noticing like whenever I'm teaching and I'm showing students artwork, they're also seeing all these like targeted ads and knowing like, oh, he's shopping for shoes. And, you know, whatever I'm looking at that day is like popped up on the side of my web browser as I'm showing them this artist, which is like completely distracting them and getting them off topic. Uh, so it's, it's an interesting like turn on surveillance, I think, that, you know, we're encountering all these targeted ads um, and not just being like monitored by a government entity, but monitored by, you know, corporations as well. So it's kind of shifting in that direction and the use of media now. Um, I mean, I've always been interested in kind of like the Dada collage and um, artists like uh, Richard Hamilton and Robert Rauschenberg and how they've kind of used collage within their work. But it really kind of like the shift of going from not using collage to using collage happened when I was working at Tandem and... Um, I would suggest like checking out uh, Judy Pfaff's and Nico Lopez's prints that they've done because a lot of it is like cutting out these like intricate patterns and then collaging it into their work. So it just kind of came out of working on what they were doing and then realizing it kind of fed into the concept of what I was working with. Uh, and then further developing that kind of collage style into something that was more my own. So it, it kind of depends on the body of work that you know I was working on at the time, whether it's uh, like chosen specific words or if I'm just kind of opening up like a news media site and taking the text from like everything that's happening right then. So a lot of it is taken directly from what's happening uh, at that time. So, um, you know, a print like Water Problems and Grumbles, that's like everything that's going on for like weeks at a time that I'm just like taking all of those headlines and articles and putting that text into Photoshop and printing out transparencies to build that up. But then, uh, you know, as I said, it's kind of taking a more specific approach now where I'm starting to look for connections between different events. So if you look at, uh, okay, so my hotel doesn't have a lobby yet it's kind of this juxtaposition of like first world problems and then more serious events. So the title is taken from a tweet that one of the U S Olympians uh, sent out at Sochi when they were complaining about all the like Olympic dorms not being finished and like, Oh, I put my head through the door and it's made of cardboard kind of thing. Uh, and then there's these, men wearing uh, baklavas that are like the non-insignia Russian troops that invaded Crimea. And that happened within like such a short time span. It's like that there's this weird kind of on our end within American culture, this like juxtaposition of our news being first world problems and then like 
look at this more gravitas heavy, you know, event that's going on. Um, I mean, that's kind of been a, an evolution of what I've encountered as like the most difficult thing. Like I said, in grad school, you know, we were kind of forced to do these installations and, you know, at first it was like, I don't want to do an installation. I'm a printmaker. I just want to make prints. Uh, and as I started to do it, you know, it became a larger part of my studio practice, uh, but as a printmaker, like one of the most difficult things I've encountered is, you know, you're taught as a 2D artist, but then you're thinking about an installation as a three-dimensional space and working within that space. So like a lot of the early installations are just using the wall as a two-dimensional surface. So it's not, you know, that different from, you know, making a print and thinking about it composing it within the picture plane of like your plate uh, or your stencil. And then it's like adversarial collaborations are a hard habit to break that I did at high point was the first time the entire installation came off of the walls and was using, you know, the center of the room as the space for the installation and thinking more in the terms of, 3D versus just being a 2D image. Um, and that's kind of, that was a difficult break because I sat there like contemplating how I'm going to use this space. And it wasn't really until like I started getting it up there and installing that I could tweak it and really play with, you know, how those forms were working in the space. Yeah, so it's the use of color is definitely uh, deconstructing, you know, what's going on in the imagery, because um, all of my work is appropriated from all of these, you know, images that show up in, you know, news articles and social media, and all of the planning and you know, uh, creating of the stencils and films that I use for. Uh, my work, whether it's a screen print or a photograph or photo etching or whatever, is done in like Photoshop and Illustrator. So I'm creating that all digitally uh, before I'm printing it, and the colors are coming from those images as like I'm deconstructing them and using like the eyedropper to choose specific colors and look at pan tones that. I'm using so it's definitely re referencing a digital aesthetic um, and a lot of the prints tend to use metallic colors and highly glossed colors which doesn't quite come through in the documentation of the work on the website uh, but when you see it in person you know a lot of the prints you know have these metallic inks that kind of shine or there's gloss over prints on them that are referencing kind of a screen in the work. And that, you know, kind of allows me to start to look at these disassociated colors as I'm kind of forcing a divorce between myself and color theory, you know, cause as a student, you're taught in foundations, all these different, you know, aspects of color theory and composition and then it's difficult because it comes second nature to kind of take that away and stop thinking about it in that way so by creating these stencils and focusing on kind of each layer being its own thing I can then be like okay this pink color is going to go on top of you know this process yellow and you know, whatever, it doesn't quite go together, but in the end, it all kind of pulls back into that digital aesthetic. Yeah, I really, um, 
that's not something I had thought about or made a connection with until I saw that question. I started looking through all my prints and I was like, there is this kind of like floral pattern that exists. Um, you know, and going from the BP logo, uh, the other ones uh, I was using are like uh, pulled from this news article about this firework display in Pyongyang, North Korea, at the same time they like launched, you know, uh, one of their missiles that everybody was in uproar that is like, oh my God, if they have nuclear weapons, they can hit California or whatever. And taking, you know, their monument or an image of the launch of that missile and creating this kind of burst that was meant more to mimic like a firework going off. But now that you say it, it's like, okay, it does have this kind of floral pattern that exists through, you know, out the body of work. Like I was talking about with the uh, installation that's using the BP logo, it's kind of taking all of these deconstructed elements and reconstructing the composition of that imagery and using that form that's within the subject matter of the photograph that I'm referencing. Um, so a lot of the titles will pull back to that main image that I'm looking at within the different images that kind of become the source material for the composition. So I'm like, collaging back together this abstracted version of that initial image that sparked that idea. So, um, let's see, like two attacks, five years apart. That one, um, was these car bombs that went off in Baghdad and kind of reconstructing this imagery using this image of a car that drove into the back of a bus in New York City and through like degrading the imagery and screen printing it kind of looks like something that's more exploded uh, than ended up underneath the back of a bus so it kind of reconstructs the that initial imagery that I was using um, by pulling it all together. So the titles tend to relay back into that main subject matter. Or um, like I was saying with, okay, so my hotel doesn't have a lobby yet. It's referencing a specific tweet or um, like a series I was working on when I was in Berlin was um, Alec Baldwin's rant on Twitter. So with that one, each piece is one of the tweets that he sent out. So it's like responding to these comments about his wife. He's like, hey, that's not true. And then he's like, but I'm going to tweet at your funeral because he is accused of tweeting at you know somebody else's funeral. And then it kind of devolves as the series continues into his rant and each piece hat is taking from that tweet. Yeah, so um, while I was in grad school in Edinburgh, we had this requirement that between our terms for between the last summer term and the fall term, we had to do what they called professional practice and we were kind of had a demand that we had to go out there and we had to either have during that time frame have an exhibition or do a residency or something that fed into our professional practice and I ended up getting a residency at Prairie Center for the Arts and it, their studio and residency is attached to a machine shop that they own that does a lot of the pieces for like Caterpillar if like something on their assembly line breaks and they have the these 
three water jets, like these massive, you know, the size of a pickup truck machines that shoot out a really fine stream of grit and water that can cut through steel plates. And with that, you can take an imagery that image that you created in like Illustrator or Photoshop and cut it out into a plate. So while I was there, I was taking these images that I was creating digitally and then using the water jet to cut out these steel plates that I was then going to Bradley University and Oscar Gillespie was kind enough to let me use the presses there and ink those up like you would a uh, relief intaglio plate and then run them through the press. So um, they have a lot larger of an embossment than you would get out of like a woodcut because I'm able to mold that paper to that steel plate as well as print it. Um, yeah, so when you're using text, like the first thing the viewer wants to do is like read everything that's going on in it. Um, and every now and then I'll get somebody that comes up to me at a show and is like frustrated because they can't read everything that's going on in it. Um, and you know, that's kind of the point with like these news so cycles is there's like this cacophony of information that's being thrown out there and it's layering it together. Um, so I want it to mainly become illegible where you can only pick out certain words within that piece. Um, the installations where I'm using vinyl cut text, that's, you know, most of it you can read a little more, but it's juxtaposing certain things, you know, like there's text about like, one direction in there versus like this like surveillance article on Google Glass um, or like whatever other event is going on at that time. So I can play with the use of text as both legible and illegible. And it's also like playing with typefaces and the history behind, you know, the invention of these different typefaces and their uses today. So like in the print work where it's layered up, uh, I'm using Franklin Gothic and that typeface is used, if you all are familiar with the publication, The Onion. And so in its print version, which you can pick up anywhere in the Midwest, which you know, when I was making the work, I was living uh, outside Minneapolis they use that typeface in there. So I was like, this is so great because it's like satire of all of this information I'm using and kind of feeds, you know, my cynical side towards, you know, mass media and that. Or in like the installations where I'm cutting vinyl, um, that typeface is Hottensweiler, which uh, Princeton did this study on the like most horrible typefaces. And a Hot and Swiler is like right under Comic Sans. As like the kerning between the letters is just like horrible and gaudy and but the odd thing that they found in this study is that the horrible typefaces tend to be what people remember more when they read something. So if you read something in Comic Sans, you're taken more away from it than if you read it in like Times New Roman. And I just kind of found that really humorous. So I was like, perfect. This is like sort of got this like Helvetica aesthetic, but it's like really compact and odd. So it's playing with a lot of that as well and the like meaning behind these different typefaces. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's referencing that a lot, and it's using type two as more of like a decorative element 
than you know something that's meant to be legible. But working at Tandem, that was kind of great because I got there and Bruce Crownover, their master printer, is like, oh, you went to Europe and got an MFA, that's nice, but our standard is at a whole nother level, you know. So you can start by cleaning up and then slowly evolve into we're going to give you more responsibilities, like sit here for eight hours and cut out Judy Pfaff's stencils. Um, but it was a really rewarding experience to see that other aspect of what's available within a career as a printmaker, you know, and working on other people's pieces and being held to that higher standard of like there can be no deviation within the edition. You know, everything is exactly the same, you know, looking at it through like loops and, you know, having a fine precision there and you know just getting to work with all of these different artists that come in that may not you know be traditionally a printmaker like uh, Robert Cottingham and seeing how we're taking this image that he is created and breaking it down into a 60 layer photolithograph that takes like a year to edition so it was just an insanely cool experience working there and it's always really fun like to now at the conferences run into those guys and catch up with them and what's going on there. Um, it oddly like I always get asked because I spent some time there like oh you went to UW for grad school and it's like no actually it just kind of happened to like through John Hitchcock get introduced to these guys and you know, then end up doing some work there. Uh, the experience at High Point, that was kind of like a different foot because then it's like instead of working on other people's work, I'm within a print shop making my own work. And it just gave me the resources and time outside of an academic institution to focus on what I was making and really evolve that work because you know when you're teaching it's kind of like finding time here and there to make work and it's like kind of start and stop and start and stop throughout like the entire process of making a print versus like during in a residency you know you just have this focused time to create work um, and Residencies are becoming more and more part of my practice, it seems like, um, through going to Berlin to work with 55. Uh, and then I just found out I got a residency at Anchor Graphics this coming summer, and I have plans to go back to Berlin again. And then the following summer, I have a residency at Atelier Presse Papier in Quebec, so there, it's evolving into more of this, like, it's part of my practice, and I go have focus time and just create an entire body of work within the span of, you know, three weeks to a month. <laughs>